Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. Shall we rise up as we pray together? Father, we do thank you for another day with you. Another day at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ to hear him speak to every one of us. And we pray, Lord, as we exalt you, and we stay in your presence to hear what you have to say. We pray, Lord, the heart, the honesty, to want to do what you are teaching us, your grant to everyone in Jesus' name. For all of us who are here, and for all those who are in every place, scattered all around this country, all around this continent, and we're attentive, wanting to hear from you. Lord, we pray that your word will be precious to every one of us in Jesus' name. We know it's not the hearers of the word that are blessed, but the doers of the word. And as we come, Lord, we pray that you help us to be doers of your word in Jesus' name. It's not what we have in the head, but what you have in the heart and with passion, with purpose. We want to actually follow and do what you have called us to do. We pray, Lord, that as you give us the strength of character and the strength of conviction to actually carry out what you are teaching us, it will bear fruit in Jesus' name. And we pray as a result of obedience to your word that many will come to know the Lord as their Lord and Savior. That we and them, they and us, on the final day, will be at the presence of the Lord as He comes to take the saints home. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the whole church said, Amen. Thank you, God bless you. You can sit down. You will notice that we are taking time to look at the Great Commission. We've been doing that now for a few weeks. You might wonder why we're doing something like this. And you might be in a hurry to go through the series we're going through. You want to understand what's on the mind of Christ. That when he raises up his own disciples, raises up members of the church, it's not just to make them righteous and holy. That's great. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be righteous. But he's raising us up, not just as members of the church, but as disciples, as apostles, as evangelists, taking out the word of God so that other people will also have this benefit of the gospel given unto them. So that... The purpose of his coming to this world will be fulfilled that those who are sinners will let you know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And then they come to uh, put their life in the hands of Jesus, they become born again like you and I. We're looking at Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. We're looking at verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'm sure you understand this chapter. is a chapter that talks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord had had a full ministry and a fulfilled life. He had actually gone about doing good and healing all that oppressed of the devil. And then he spoke to them how they will move out of darkness and come into the light. How they will come, confide in him, trust him, believe him, have faith in him, so that they will not perish. While he was on earth, he had assured everyone, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever in Israel, whosoever in any other nation, whosoever among the Gentiles will believe, will not perish, but have everlasting life. And the very purpose why he came is so that this life, 
that she came to give the abundant life, the eternal life, the spiritual life, will become yours and mine, will belong to virtually everybody. And now he was crucified. You know that was according to the plan of God. Because the plan of God is that it will offer, it will give, it will surrender, it will sacrifice his very life for the salvation of humanity. And so he went to the cross and he died. And after that death on the cross of Calvary, you know the story, he was buried. And then on the third day, he rose from the dead. Now if you were, that you be with some people, and now you died. And the Jews thought, your enemies thought, it's all over. That nothing will happen anymore. And then you rose up on the third day. And you appear to the people that were your followers, who are committed to you, who are your disciples. I'm asking you, what will you be telling them? What will you be interested in passing across to them? As Jesus rose from the dead. Then he got all these disciples together. He had appeared unto them, and he showed them many infallible proofs. That means proof of his resurrection, that nobody could get saved, that nobody could contradict. Everybody knew among the disciples of Jesus, our Master, our Lord, our Savior, Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he rose from the dead. Now, if you were, what will you tell them at such a time? What information will you pass across to them? What revelation will you give them? You know, there are people that may think that the best thing at this time now will be for Jesus Christ to describe all that happened all these three days to in the grave. And what's going to happen in the great beyond? But you know, the most important thing, which is evangelism, telling the people why he died, telling the people why Jesus went to the cross, sacrificed, surrendered his life, and now his blood had been shed. That's why he gave them the great commission. And as you look at that verse 15, and he said unto them, and he said unto them, he said unto the people that believed in him, you see, this work is for the believers. It's not unto them outside, outside the camp, outside the body of Christ, outside the, uh, the, the, the assembly or the congregation of the believers. But he said unto them believers. Unto them, children of God. Unto them, the people that have believed on him, and they were saved. Their sins were taken away. They had the assurance within them. We are children of God. And now he said unto them, and if you are a child of God, then you feed among that congregation, among that group, among those people of God. And he's saying unto you today, what did he tell them? Go ye into all the world. Stop right there. Go ye into all the world. And you understood that? And we need to understand that. Look at verse 20. And the wage falls. And the wage falls. Isn't that great? That the Lord Jesus Christ, having risen from the dead, he told them, Go ye into all the world. And then after Jesus went back to heaven, and they went forth. What did he tell them to do? Go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What did they do? Look at verse 20. And they preached everywhere. And they preached everywhere. You see the obedience of the early church. The moment they heard, then they rose up and they went forth to do exactly what the Lord had called them to do. And isn't that a wonderful evidence that we actually believe the Lord, we actually accept the Lord, and we actually receive everything the Lord is giving unto us. As the Lord tells us on Monday like this, and He says, go into all the world. And then on Tuesday, the very following day, you go into all the buses, all the taxis, and all the bus stops, and all the places of work, and all the marketplaces, and all the offices, and you actually go forth, and you do what the Lord has called you to do. And they went forth, and they preached each everywhere the Lord walking with them. The Lord likes to walk with the obedient. The Lord likes to walk with the faithful. 
the Lord likes to work, but the people that take his word seriously. And they went forward, and the Lord said, These obedient people, faithful people, dependable people, trustworthy people, I'm going to work with them. And he went with them, and he worked with them, and they were told, He confirmed the word with signs following. Come back to verse 15. And preach the gospel to every creature. No discrimination. And you will not kind of isolate this group. This one cannot hear. This one will not listen. Preach the gospel to every creature. And in preaching the gospel to every creature, we do it one on one. Actually, they have seen the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, before the cross. Number two, on the cross. And later they will see after the cross. Before the cross, what did he do? One on one. He preached the word to Nicodemus. One on one. Before the cross, what did he do? He preached the gospel to the woman of Samaria, one on one. What did he do? Before the cross, he preached the word and he brought this man Zacchaeus to know him. Today, his salvation entered into the south. What did he do? Before the cross, he spoke to Peter, Simon Peter, follow me, I'll make you officials of it. Before the cross, what did he do? Personal evangelism, Matthew. He saw him collecting taxes, rise up, follow me, and then he rose up and he followed him before the cross one on one preaching the word personal evangelism how about on the cross do you remember on the cross this man on the cross the thief on the cross Lord remember me when you come it's your kingdom I seal to you today you'll be with me in paradise one on one after the resurrection i told you before the cross i told you on the cross and now we come after the cross after the burial, after the resurrection, now Saul was going on the way to Damascus, one on one. And a light shone around him, brighter than the brightness of the sun. And then he said, Saul, Saul, he called him by name, one on one, personal evangelism. Why persecutest thou me? It's said for you to kick against the priest. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. Whom thou persecutors, and then what shall I do, Lord? And eventually, you know, before an ask got to him, he said, Brother Saul, that man had been converted. The Lord has shown us the example that whether it is before the cross, or on the cross, or after the cross, we reach people one by one. And we touch their lives. And they were able to preach the gospel unto them. And the gospel they hear as they receive it. And they repent of their sins. And they rely on the Lord. Believing on the Lord. Then they are saved. And their lives are turned around. They become new creatures in Christ. Now the early church took that word. That's the word of the Lord. They took it so seriously. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 4. In Acts chapter 8, verse 4, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad, went everywhere, preaching the word. They that were scattered abroad, went everywhere, preaching the word. I'm going to uh, make some illustration to you. Now, if you start from Acts chapter 1, and you go to Acts chapter 2, chapter 3, now up to chapter 8, and they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And let me just make it like this. Let's take this just illustration. This is not a doctrine. This illustration. Let's take a chapter for a year. And then let's take the time that deeper life our church began. 1973. And then we were born again. The people were coming in. They were hearing the word of God. They were getting born again. Saved. Children of God. And then eventually, as it became that first year, the zeal of the Lord and the passion and the enthusiasm and the eagerness and the fire of the Holy Spirit within us, and we went everywhere preaching the word. Even to the second year and the third year and the fourth year, maybe to the eighth year. If you add age to 73, you're going to have 81. And at least, you know, all that period, we still kept on preaching the word. We were not ashamed in any time. 
in any boss, in any in any community, in any locality, it was preaching the word. And the, what was important for us at that time, I'm talking about from chapter 1 to chapter 8. I'm talking about year 1 to year 8. What was important for us? Just preaching the word everywhere. And anywhere you have a member of this church standing, or anywhere you find a member of this church sitting, anywhere you find us walking, we open our Bible, we give our tracts, we open our mouth, and we preach the word unto them. Now, after some time, we're looking at Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And I'm reading now from verse 4 and from verse 5. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast led thy first love. And the Lord was writing in an epistle letter. He was sending the message of word to the churches of Asia Minor. And this is representative. We've studied Revelation already. You know this. That this is representative of the church. In fact, this is the first church of the seven that Jesus Christ sent a message to. And this first church is a picture of the early church. The first church. And it came to the time evangelism went to the back burner. That means evangelism was relegated to the background. Other things came to the forefront. Activity. Other things. Church administration and church growth and church development and caring for the people. And he quite a lot of good, good things. They are not bad things, but evangelism, the most important, went to the background. Isn't that what is happening in our own church here? You know, in our own church here, we thank God for teaching. The teaching is there. We thank God for church administration. Administration is there. We thank God for church activity. Activity is there. We thank God for church programs. Programs are there. But we have shifted away from Acts chapter 8. We have shifted away from year 8. Year 1 to year 8. That's evangelism. So giving up the gospel, preaching the gospel to every creature is no more the art, the attitude, or the activity of every member of the church. And the Lord is saying, I saw what against you, because you have led your first love. Then it says in verse 5, remember therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first words. What was he saying? Recover. The lost art of evangelism. Oh, you see, but he doesn't mention evangelism there. Yes, I understand. But he mentions the first love. Love towards God. The first God as number one. Love towards the Lord Jesus Christ that pulls Christ and his cross and Calvary and his sacrifice and his great commission as number one. Love towards the souls of the people that are perishing, that will put them as number one in our program, in our desire, in our aspiration, in our ambition. Love towards the kingdom of God to expand the kingdom of God and decrease the kingdom of darkness. Love towards heaven, that you will love heaven so much, you want a lot of people to get to heaven. The first love. And Jesus said, you have left your first love. Then he says, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. What's the meaning of that? Remember the upper life, year one, year two, year three, up to year eight, when everybody took personal evangelism as the number one thing. Now, whatever you were doing in the church, now actually we said at that, that time, in the ministry, in the ministry, whatever you were doing in the ministry, the most important thing, the most essential thing, and the thing that was on top of your heart, is reaching out and talking to everybody about the word of the Lord and about the salvation of their soul. And the Lord is saying, bring it back. Recover it. It is lost already, but bring it back. How do you do that? Look at Second Kings chapter chapter six. Second Kings chapter six, and I'm reading to you from verse one. Recovering the lost art of personal evangelism. Second Kings chapter six, 
verse 1. And the sons of the prophet said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, every man a beam, every man a beam. Don't you know we're building the temple of God? We're building an habitation for God. And the instruments or the tools or the blocks or the elements that God uses in building that edifice are souls that are one into the kingdom. And every man has a part to play. Every brother, every sister has a part to play. And he answered, Go in. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was spelling, cutting down a beam, the axe edge fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. I'm sure you know this story. But we're making this as an illustration to help ourselves. You know the axe edge in any church is this desire and passion and zeal and fire and decision and the thrust for evangelism. Once that is off, the axe edge is gone. And then if we're going to recover the axe edge, number one, there should be realization. Without that realization, are we going to even cry out? We've lost something. We're missing something. Although the activities are there, although all the other things are there, the administration is there, we have lost something. You cry out. And then we cry to the right source. We're crying to the servants of the Lord. And we're crying unto the Lord himself. Let's pray. And as we pray like that, asking the Lord, we have lost something precious, something important, something central, something significant. We need each back. And what a wonderful thing it will be if this church, with all the branches, and with all the leaders and the workers and the members, all who are hearing the sound of my voice right now, if everyone will cry to the Lord and say, Yes, we know, good church, wonderful church, church of great programs, but we have lost the art of evangelism. The art's head is gone. And then, what a wonderful thing it will be if we, as a whole together, in unity, we travail before the Lord, and we cry before the Lord, and we pray before the Lord, Lord, we need our axe head back. And then it says, and the man of God said, where fell it? Don't you have to locate where this evangelism thrust, and zeal, and passion, and fire, and confidence, assurance, don't we need to find out where we lost it? You know, if you have lost something, and you don't even know that you have lost anything, you will not seek for it. But if you will know that you have lost something important, something significant, and you are saying, when did I lose it? Now, church, can we think as a body together, when did we actually stop this personal evangelism? Which year? Think about it. What then became the most important thing to us that replaced that evangelism? Think about it, because if you don't find out when it was lost, where it was lost, how it was lost, you're not going to recover it. We'll just come to Bible study and have another wonderful time together, 12.1.2.3, and then wasn't that a great Bible study? If we don't see and find out when and where, and how we lost that earth, we'll never be able to recover it. Then the, the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place we must locate, the place where it was lost, the year when it was lost. 
what became the most important thing to us when it was lost. And then we'll be able to now have the power and the strength, the revelation of the Lord, on how to recover. And it says, he cut down, he cut down a steep and cast it in there. And the iron did swim. The iron will swim again. Amen. Revelation will come again. Amen. The power, the thirst, the energy, the enthusiasm will come again in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore said he, take it. Take it up to me. You, you need to take it up again. Now that God is giving us revelation and is renewing our heart, we need to take it up again. That's why we came today. And I'm believing that this study of the word of God will do something in your heart. And we will take it back again in Jesus' name. Recovering the lost arch of personal evangelism. We divide the message to three parts. Number one, consequences of neglecting personal evangelism. The consequences of neglecting personal evangelism. Number two, compelling necessity of personal evangelism. The compelling necessity of personal evangelism. Number three now, commitment needed for personal evangelism. Commitment that's needed for personal evangelism. The consequences of neglecting personal evangelism. We already know we're children of God, we're Bible students, and we know our Bibles enough to understand that sinners cannot get saved without the preaching of the gospel. Everybody knows that. And if the soul winner's duty is to preach the gospel to the sinners, if we don't carry out that duty, and if we don't do something about it, there will be a consequence. And actually, the consequence of neglecting personal evangelism, there are many. Number one is the loss and the waste of ripened harvest. The loss and the waste of ripened harvest. We're looking at John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 35. Say not ye that are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. You know, the Lord is very much interested in how we discuss among one another. Say not ye, are you not talking? Are you not discussing? Are you not kind of uh, imagining among yourselves that it's not time yet? There's still time. There's still time. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. The Lord was telling them, you don't see what I see. All of you disciples, you see, in another way. What in that say uh, the purpose of God and the plan of God in our lives when we don't see how God sees? What hinders the purpose of God, the plan of God, for all the servants of God, for all the saints of God, for all the children of God, when the saints of God, the servants of God, the children of God, when they do not see what Christ, our Lord, our Master, what you see. And the Lord said, are you not saying that there are yet four months, and then will come the time of the harvest? But he says, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, for the fields are white already to harvest. I pray we'll see what God is seeing. In verse 30 says, and, it's, and, and he that reapeth receiveth wages. He that reapeth receiveth wages. Of course, if we're not reaping, the consequence is we're going to miss the wages or the reward of the work we should have done and gathered fruit unto eternal life, life eternal. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I send you to reap that which whereon ye bestowed no labor. All the men labored and ye have entered, ye are entered into their labors. 
And you understand what the Lord Jesus was saying? He said, a lot of work has been done already. He's saying, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Andrew, Philip, everyone, much has been done already. Already the people I told you to go to, they believe they say God in heaven. You don't have to go to the children of Israel arguing about whether there's God or there's no God. Other people have done that primary work. They believe there is God. Not only that, we know that Messiah coming already. They know the prophecy that the Messiah is coming. They know some basic things already. You're not going to people that are totally neutral, totally neutral, according in the word of God. They know there is a heaven. They know there is a hell already in the land of Israel. And all you need to do now is to show them how to move out of the path that leads to perdition, that leads to hell, and direct them onto the path that leads to heaven. Other people have labored. You think about it in our country here. For example, most of the people already believe there is God. You don't have to go on evangelism and be convincing the majority of people. There may be some isolated people who will say whether there's God or not. They're, they're the minority. They're negligible. But the majority of people already, somebody else has taught them. They already know there is God. And about Jesus Christ, in fact, at this time right now, many people, they are fasting. Forty days of Lent. They know there was a time Jesus came. They already know that. They know that there was a time that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died. In fact, they're going to keep what they call Good Friday. And then they're even going to celebrate Easter, Resurrection Day. Many people already know that Jesus Christ died and he was buried and he rose again. Other people have done that primary work. And the rest for us now is just to go and tell them the significance of that resurrection of Jesus Christ unto their lives. That's why Jesus Christ said, other people have labored already. And you are going into their labor so that you can then harvest them into the kingdom of God. It's, you know, it's just like you. Uh, we have them, um, some young people, they go to the university. And the, the lecturers at the university, they need to understand that they are not starting from the scratch. Already those young people, somebody else taught them the alphabet. Somebody else taught them how to put the words together. Somebody else taught them how to write good English. Somebody else taught them how to make some preliminary things. And therefore, these other lecturers, what do they do? They just make use of what other people have done in the lives of these young people. That's what the Lord is telling us. Other people have labored already. And think about the preaching of the Bible. Think about translating the Bible from Hebrew and Greek and translating to English language and then our local languages. Other people have done that already. Much has been done by other people. All we need to do now is take that Bible already available and take that word already available and go to the people and tell them it's a simple word. Other people have done the greater work and the most difficult work. We now go to them with the gospel. If we don't do it, the, uh, the, the result is, the consequence is, the harvest that is ripened already will be wasted, will be lost. It will not be lost. Amen. We're going to do it. Number two, it will be that the sinner's blood will be required on in our hands if we're, neg if we're negligent. In Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Look up here for a moment. What if you are employed as a guard? as a watchman, as a security officer. And then you are told you are the security officer. Now, you are watching over all the seats here. This is your work. And the letter of appointment has been given to you. Or you have been spoken to verbally that you are the watchman, you are the guard, you are the security officer. If you go to sleep, or if you go to do some other good, good things, not bad things, but you are not at your post, and you are not securing, watching over the things you are told to watch over, and all those things are stolen away, precious things. Then you'll be called to question, and then there'll be a penalty upon you. It's like the Lord is telling us, I've given it to you already. 
I told you already that you are a watchman over the souls of the people. Now, you know that in the New Testament, even where that language is used, and what does the Bible say? Put your finger in Ezekiel, your finger in Ezekiel, and come to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And I'm reading there from verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves for the watch for your souls, as they that must give account. The part I want you to look at, the watch over your souls. The watch over your souls. And they will give account. The Lord has already appointed the leader that you are watching over souls. But then he appoints every believer that the people around you who do not know the Lord, you are watching over them. This one must not go to hell. And it's very simple. It's not in your strength, it's not in your power that you're going to pull them into the kingdom. It's just the power of the world. You just open your mouth. My friend, Jesus died for you. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to suffer the consequences of your sin, either here on earth or in eternity, beyond the grave. How can I do it? If you will just come to the Lord, confess your sin, turn away from them, very simple, within five minutes, ten minutes, He will forgive you. You'll be saved. He'll write your name in the book of life. And you'll be secured. That's all. And if you didn't do that to tell them and to warn them and to bring them to the Lord, if they are lost, you'll, you're going to give account. That means then the consequence of neglecting. Personal evangelism is that their blood will be required action. We are back in Ezekiel chapter 3, Son of Man. I have made thee a watchman over the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning for me. That's all. So simple. Hear the word and the Lord will not fail. He'll give you the word. Now you hear the word from his mouth and then you give them warning. And they're willing to listen if you're willing to speak. They are willing to hear who is not willing to hear, how he will not perish, how he will not be condemned, how he will not die in sin, how he will not go to hell, how he will not suffer forever and ever. You test people, my friend, come. I want to show you how you will never suffer in your life again. It's all ears I want to hear. I want to tell you how you will be happy. Happy from now until you die. And then how you will secure a good place in heaven after you are dead. He will want to hear. I want to tell you something. I want to show you how the devil will not have power over your life anymore until you die. Come and tell me. I want to hear. I want to tell you how, the, how something can be a help to you. And you'll be so helped and lifted over the stormy waters of life. I'm all ears. I want to hear. Everybody wants to know. If you will go and give them the good news, the glad tidings, the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for them, and they ought to be saved, they don't have to die. You are a watchman over them. Then it says in verse 18, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way. Save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. His blood will I require at thine hand. And that means then, if we don't tell them, they are going to be lost. We're going to tell them. I said we're going to tell them. And our reward is going to be great. In Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Another reason why we need to go out very quickly and tell them is that this is another consequence now that if we're ashamed of Christ here on earth, he too will be ashamed of us. Ashamed of us. But I, I don't understand why some people will say, really, I am ashamed. I'm ashamed. I cannot, I cannot tell other people about Christ. And I'm asking them, what are you ashamed of? I say, are you born again? Yes, I'm born again. Are you happy? Yes, I am happy. Is your life fulfilled in Christ? Yes, it's fulfilled. Does God answer your prayer? Yes, He answers my prayer. What are you ashamed of? It just, I ask you, are you married? Yes, I am married. Tell that friend there that you are a married man. 
Oh, I'm ashamed. Ashamed? Oh, you go to that friend, friend, do you know that a marriage? Now, I say, are you successful in life? Have you got a certificate? Have you gone to school? Have you graduated? Oh, yes. Tell that friend over there, do you know that I've graduated already? Are you ashamed of that? Of course, no. Has your sin been forgiven? Yes. Tell that person there, my sin is forgiven. How were you forgiven? I confess my sin. I turned away from my sin, and Jesus forgave me. I am healthy. From since I gave my life to the Lord for about, you know, five years now, maybe you're saying that uh, the Lord has been keeping me strong and healthy. Tell your friend over there. Do you know that uh, for five years now, since I came to this Jesus, I'm healthy. I'm strong. And I'm very, very happy. Who is ashamed of a thing like that? And then you tell them, he did it for me, he will do it for you. It's not, there's no excuse at all to be ashamed of what Christ can do and what Christ wants to do in your life. Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I pray you will not be ashamed. Another thing is the loss of the soul winner's reward. The loss of the soul winner's reward. You see, if you are not witnessing, you are losing quite a lot. You are losing the reward of the servants of God. You're losing the reward of being a soul winner in Matthew chapter 13, verse 12. Matthew chapter 13, verse 12. For whosoever has to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. It's saying for those who have, and if you read the whole parable, those who have actually toiled, and they have done what they ought to do. And those who have come to the Lord, and they are obedient to the Lord, and faithful to the Lord. And in your faithfulness to the Lord, the Lord will give you the reward of faithfulness. That's what he's saying. Whosoever has to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever has not, from him shall be taken, he, taken away, even that he has. That is, if you are not making use of your privilege, and your possibilities, your potentials, and the, uh, the, the word of God, the opportunity you have got to tell other people, then there will be no reward. Even what you seem to have will be taken away from you. I pray that will not happen to you. And you know that the people who are not evangelizing, they even, they are hurting themselves. You are not telling other people about the Lord. You are not excited about the Lord. Your prayers are going to be in the because you see, and you say, God, do this for me, do this for me. And then the Lord is saying, the one I did for you, have you told anybody? Have you made that opportunity, privilege, open to all the people? I've blessed you, I've saved you, I've healed you, I've provided for you, I've done quite a lot for you. Have you ever opened your mouth to tell other people, other people who are suffering like you were suffering? Other people who are unfortunate in life, like you are unfortunate in life, I helped you. I lifted you. You should have told them so that they too, they'll be able to have what you have got. And if you have not, if you are, if you are not telling them, then when you cry out to the Lord, your prayers are in them. In Proverbs chapter 21 verse 13. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 13. It says, Whoso stoppeth, whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but he shall not be heard. Whosoever stoppeth his ear from hearing the word, uh, from uh, the cries of the people, that is the need of the people. The people that need to hear about Christ the Savior, about Christ the Lord, about Christ, that is the, the reason for reconciliation with God, the bridge between the sinful man and the holy God. And you stop your ears from telling them, being concerned about their predicament. Then it says, you also you will cry, and then you will not be heard. That's the reason we ought to actually rise up and do what the Lord has called us to do. We will do it in Jesus' name. In Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 14. 
Romans chapter 1, verse 14. It tells us, Romans 1, 14. Um, data, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, I am debtor. Not just I was, but even to the present time, I am. You think about a man like Paul the Apostle, from the time that the Lord called him, he started preaching the gospel, telling other people about the Lord. And yet he still said, every moment of the way, forgetting what he had done, I'm still today a debtor, both to the barbarians and to the Greeks, both to the wise and to the unwise. That means both to the intelligent and to the unintelligent, both to the illiterate and to the elites, to the educated both to the high and the low, both to the people in the city, the wise, and then those in the rural areas, in the villages, the unwise. He said in verse 15, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. I am ready. And you think about all the places you have been, if you have read the Acts of the Apostles, Jerusalem, Iconium, and then to all the other places, Thessalonica, and yet he said, yes, there is still a place on the map I've not gone to, and that is Rome. And I'm a debtor to the people at Rome as well, and I'm willing to come unto you, and I'm ready to come unto you. Where have you been? Of all the places on the map, have you ever taken the map of your own city? or the map of your local government, or the map of your region, or the map of your state, and then you pinpoint all those places on the map. Look at this, you've not gone there. 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 Virtually, you've not gone out of your house. You go from the house to the church, from the church to the house, from the house to the office, from the office to the house, no other place. Why don't you look at all those places on the map and say, I'm a debtor to the people at Rome, I'm a debtor to the people over here, I'm a debtor to the people over there, and then plan to pay the debt that you owe, so that you'll take the gospel, the word of God, unto them. That's why it says in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew force and also to the Greek. I come to point number two. In point number two, the compelling necessity of personal evangelism. Compelling necessity of personal evangelism. Already I've explained to you that personal evangelism is a compelling necessity for every believer. That is one on one, talking to people, preaching to people, reaching out to people, touching the lives of people, one on one. It is not the will of God that any should perish. In Second Peter chapter two, chapter three, rather. Second Peter chapter three. I'm reading verse nine. Second Peter three nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long sovereign towards word, not willing, listen to this, not willing that any shall perish, but that all shall come to repentance. If that's your heart, you have the heart of God. If that's your mind, then you have the mind of Christ. Not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. Uh, look up here. Uh, an accident has taken place. And this fellow is bleeding, and he's crying for help, and you're standing nearby. And you say, you know what? I'm not willing that he will die. I'm not willing that he should bleed to death. I am not willing. I want him to be saved. I don't want him to die in this condition. But you're holding your hand, and you're standing aloof. and you're turning your back on that individual. But I am not willing that he should die. Well, action speaks louder than words. If you are not willing that he should die, you abandon every other sin, you bend down, you bend low, you carry him, you take him to a place where he can be cared for so that he will not die. If we have the mind of Christ, and we have the same heart with God, and we're not willing, like God is not willing that any should perish, you'll rise up, you'll tell other people, 
then your offices there, then your neighborhood there, you'll be telling them because you are not willing. It is your action. It is the evangelism. It is the soul winning. It is the talking to them, touching them, reaching them, and speaking to them that shows that you are really not willing that any of them should perish, but that they shall come unto life eternal. First Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3 and verse 4. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and verse 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Remember, they, they see that there's no full stop there at the end of verse 3. Who will have all men to be saved? Who will have all men to be saved? And if, if that's your mind, you'll do something about it. He wants all men to be saved. Every day you meet more unsaved people than saved people. Every day in your place of work. Every day in your market, every day in the bus, every day on the road, every day in your community, you meet, you interact with more unsaved people than saved people, more unchurched people than churched people, more people that do not know Christ than the people that know Christ. And if it is your mind, your heart, your desire, your passion, to have all men saved, those people you meet, you will talk to them. And it doesn't matter whatever consecration you say you have. It's only a word, empty word. Oh Lord, I've surrendered everything to you. Show it in your action. And show it what you're preaching. And show it what you're soul winning. Oh Lord, I lay everything upon the altar. I belong to you. My time belongs to you. My energy belongs to you. Everything I have belongs to you. That's word, empty word. You don't have to talk too loud. I don't have to talk too long. Go out and show the people and tell them God doesn't want you to perish. You can be saved. You can be born again. It's not just what we say when we pray. It is what we do after we are praying. When you go to the people, you actually show them that Christ does not want them to perish and you don't want them to perish either. Look at that verse 4 again. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And that's what the Lord wants us to actually do. He wants us to go out and tell the people. First Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9. We're reading from verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. Necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. It says, when I preach the gospel, you know what has happened? I'm just avoiding the judgment of God. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. I want to avoid the judgment of God. I want the blessing of God upon my life. That's why I go out and preach the gospel. And what's the, how do we say that this word is compelling, that it must be done? Oh, because there are a lot of people that need to hear. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Here are the words of Jesus, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted and they were scattered abroad, a sheep having no shepherd. And we know the shepherd, the good shepherd that gave his life for the sheep, that's Jesus Christ. And you have a lot of people having no shepherd, and you know the shepherd already. He is your Savior. He is your Lord. And you can easily tell them. And Jesus already said, all the sheep I have who are not of this fold, them I must bring. You are the hand of Jesus to bring all the sheep and bring them into the fold. And there shall be one fold and there shall be one shepherd. And that's why it's a compelling necessity for you and for me to reach out, go out to the people and bring them to know the Lord. And we don't have too much time. We don't have too much time because the time is short. First Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 7 rather. First Corinthians chapter 7 verse, 20, verse 29. First Corinthians 7 verse 29. It says, But this I say, brethren, 
the time is short. The time is short. As we think about the people all around us, you see them today, tomorrow they are gone. You see them this week, this week they are dead. You see them, you interact with them, you trade with them, you sell to them, you buy from them. This year, the next year they are dead already. The time is short. That's the reason why we need to go to them in time. Verse 29, this I say, brethren, the time is short. He remained the both day that have wise be as though they have none. What you're saying is, don't allow uh, the, the provision of the Lord, the blessing of the Lord, the provision of your wife, or the, the, the blessing of children, or the blessing of your success in your place of work. Don't allow the blessing of God to hinder your responsibility, what you need to do for the kingdom of God. In verse 30, and they that we, as though they went not, don't allow what you are weeping about, what you are crying about. To hinder you from doing what the Lord has called you to do. And you know, as you, as you think about it really, it's like, you know, people are now concentrating on their problems. And many churches, that's what they do. And we have nothing against any church. We bless the Lord for every good thing every good church is doing. But you know, many of the churches, even our own church here, we concentrate on problems. And, you know, our, our members, they want you, if you're a leader, you're a coordinator, you're a group coordinator, you're a pastor, you're an overseer, they want you to just sit down and counsel members of the church. We have a lot of problems in the church. And this one needs uh, counseling, and that one needs prayer, and that one needs attention. Pastor, preacher, or counselor, or coordinator, group, sit down, sit down. Don't go anywhere, because our church will have problems. They that weave as though they work not. And you know our people, many of our people, all they want now, they go to the prayer warrior, they go to the, they come to the pastor, they come to, you know, anybody that can help them, they're weeping, they're weeping, and the Lord says, they that weep, as though they work not, don't concentrate on your problems. When you concentrate on the needs of other people, and you're reaching out to them, and you forget yourself, and you forget your problem, and you forget your own load and your own burden, you'll find while you are helping other people to come to know the Lord, and you're bringing them to the kingdom, the Lord will be taking care of you and taking care of your problems. They that weep as though they wait not. Do you know there are even churches that will say, you're talking about planning crusade for our city here, why are you talking about that? You know, the money we have, you want to spend everything just planning for crusade. Look at the niche in the church. Look at the people there, they don't have enough to eat. And the people there, they don't have, they don't have that. If we tell you, our, our brethren, our members, so are weeping, that, you know, we need to just concentrate. Everything we have in the church, spend it on them. They that weep, as though they went not, don't concentrate on problems, concentrate on possibilities. The possibilities of reaching out to the people that need to hear the gospel, the people that need to hear the word of the Lord, and come to the Lord. And then you are going to bring joy to the angels of God in heaven, and joy will come to your life as well in Jesus' name. So then, let's concentrate on the word of God, giving it to the people that are perishing. Another reason, it's a compelling necessity, is that there's a certainty of eternal judgment of the laws. The certainty of eternal judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men, once to die, but after this, the judgment, the reality of judgment, the certainty of judgment, the imminence of judgment, it is soon to come. And that's the reason why we need to reach out to the people so that they will be saved. You know what we're talking about? We're talking about recovering the art of the lost art of personal evangelism. And now we understand we need to have this compelling necessity registered on our heart. And to know that we need to recover this so that we can go back to our first love. A false enthusiasm, a false passion, a false zeal, reaching out to the people that need to be saved, it will be done. Yes. We're coming to point number three now, commitment needed for personal evangelism. Commitment needed for personal evangelism. But you know what? 
Even after we have known all the things that we are studying, you know, somebody said, knowledge is power. No. Applied knowledge is power. It's not just knowledge. It's the knowledge you take, you digest, you assimilate, you meditate upon, and you act upon. That's the kind of knowledge that is power. If you hear people say, knowledge is power. No. It's applied knowledge. Practical knowledge. Knowledge that makes you to do something. You rise up. You cannot rest anymore. That knowledge of the need of sinners. That knowledge of the passion, the desire in the heart of the Almighty God. That knowledge that you, an instrument now in the hand of God, then you rise up and you go to tell them that's the knowledge, practical, applied, that drives you. That's the knowledge that is power. And that's why if you have such knowledge, you have looked at the Word of God, you have heard the Word of God, and you have assimilated the Word of God, you are meditating on the Word of God, is going to lead you to commitment. That's why we have this point number three, commitment needed for personal evangelism. And, and, and there will be something in your heart that will want to say, I will do something. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. We're looking at verse 43. Luke chapter 4, verse 43. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to all the cities also. For therefore am I said, look at that word, preach. I must preach. Remove that P there. What's that? Preach. Reach them. You see, there are people that are saying, but, you know, I am preaching. I'm asking you, who are you reaching? Reach them. If you are really preaching, you'll be reaching people. You'll be touching the lives of people. Look at that word, preach. Remove that R. What, does, what remains? Each. Each of them. Each of them. You are going to each person. You know the people that just say, I preach, and then I'm asking them, or we're asking them, are you reaching out? No, all I, all I want to do is just to preach. No, you cannot preach without reaching them. You reach their hearts. You reach them at the point where they are. And it is that reaching them that actually makes the preaching meaningful. And then you are reaching each one, each one, each one, going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, each creature. And so he tells us here, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I must preach the kingdom of God to all the cities also. For therefore am I sent. And if you have come to the church and you don't know yet what you are saying, therefore am I saying, and you're still wasting quite a lot of time, and the Lord is saying, friend, child, what you are doing, this is not what I sent you for. These things are good. In your extra time, you should do them almost like hobby. But the real thing you ought to do, and the real important essential thing, is to get to each person and reach them and preach to them and bring them into the kingdom. And except we're doing that, we have not done yet what we're called to do. Reach them, preach to them. We're told in um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, Acts chapter 19. We're reading here from, let's go to chapter 9, Acts, chapter 9, reading from verse 15. Acts chapter 9, reading from verse 15. Here it says, For the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. I'm a chosen vessel. I said I'm a chosen vessel. Uh, you know, you should see yourself not an ordinary person, ordinary brother, ordinary sister. The Lord says it's upon you. And because the, Lord call, the Lord's calling is upon you, you don't see yourself just as everybody else. Just, uh, you know, doing what everybody else is doing. 
go in the direction everybody else is going. Understand, you are a chosen vessel. Paul was a chosen vessel in his own generation. And you in your own generation, you are a chosen vessel. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I'm going to ask you, what did Paul the Apostle, after the Lord, call him? Understand, Paul the Apostle was uh, a highly educated man in his own generation. Paul the Apostle was uh, a highly uh, placed person among the Sanhedrin. You know the Sanhedrin, they are the political hierarchies of the day. What he now said, now I have the light. Now I have the knowledge. Now I have the Spirit of God. I am going to transform these politics in Israel. And I'm going to transform all these people that I do it because now I have the power of God and the Spirit of God. If he went there and he joined politics, the Sanhedrin, and he says, I am back. All of you, of course, you know me. I'm Saul of Tarsus. I met Jesus Christ. Now I have power and I have this and that. Whatever he did in that place will be a waste of his time. Because in the case of this Paul I'm talking about, he was a chosen vessel. And as a chosen vessel, what he was to do was very clearly marked out for him. And he wasn't free to just go here and say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. A lot of believers today, you have ambition. Ambition here, ambition there, ambition in the other place. The question is, if you know you are a chosen vessel, what has he chosen you to do? To bear my name before the Gentiles and then before kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And they were told that Ananias went his way and entered into the house and put his hand on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. I pray afresh, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. And the Lord will actually use you mightily in Jesus' name. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now you know. You are a chosen vessel. And the Lord has called you and commissioned you to get something done. How are you going to do it? Here it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, the word, therefore, therefore, because you are called, because you are chosen, because you are appointed, because you are a watchman, because you are a soul winner, because the Lord has committed something into your hand. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Be ye steadfast. That word steadfast there. I want you, why don't you look up for a moment in the, you see the, uh, Paul the Apostle, I told you, he was a master of the Greek language. And he knew, Paul the Apostle knew how they talked about the word steadfast. You know, he was a tent maker. And as a tent maker, he will go to a particular area. He will study the condition of that place there. If the wind was blowing very much there, he knows the kind of wind that blew there. And as a tent maker, he will put his tent down. And then all the stakes, all the strings of the, of the tent, he will test it and shake it and know that it is steadfast. When he used that word steadfast, what it meant is no wind can blow that tent down. That's the way they used the word steadfast at that time. And Paul, as a tent maker, he was very, very familiar when he said steadfast. And the Lord is telling us, be you then, be ye steadfast. That means the winds will blow. Winds of trial and winds of temptation, and winds of difficulty. But it says, be steadfast. Branch your feet on solid ground, that whatever may come, and whatever may go, and whatever difficulties you have, the winds and the storms that will blow. You know that this is the activity, and this is the work, and this is the assignment the Lord has given you. Be ye steadfast, that you will not say, you know, I really wanted to evangelize, and I made up my mind, I was going to do this and do this and do that, but you know, the wind began to blow, 
And as the wind began to blow now, if you were myself, what would you have done? Because I lost my job. I became sick. I became weak. And then I had a lot of persecution. I had a lot of what? That's why the Lord is saying, Be ye therefore steadfast, that even though the wind may blow, this evangelism will not be taken away from your life. And then it says, unmovable. Now you understand that word, steadfast. You know that there are some things over here that will almost move you away from where the Lord has put you. That word unmovable once again. It's like, you know, Paul the Apostle, he was choosing those words by the, uh, by the revelation of the Spirit of God very carefully. Unmovable, unmovable. They used that word in the olden days of the Greek literature uh, for the people uh, that were, you know, they built a particular thing. And it's not going away from the tent. It's not going to a solid build because, you know, in the case of a tent, when he finished what, whatever I was doing there, he removed the tent and go to another place. But now, he said, because I use the word steadfast, you may think that, all right, after some time now, we'll move that tent. I'm using the word steadfast for you to know that the wind shall not blow you down. But now I'm telling you that make it like a solid building. That it is not moving like a tent. That it is there. You come this year, it's there. You come the following year, it's there. And how many of you had the experience uh, when you were back at home? There's a building, whenever you enter the town, you saw the building there. And then you came over here, and then you traded after some years, you went back home, and lo and behold, you saw the building there. And then you come back over here, and then after some years again, you want to visit home, and you saw the building there. That's the word of movable. That you are stable, but like a solid rock. And no matter what is happening, no matter what comes and what goes, no matter the circumstances, you are unmovable in the work of the Lord, in the evangelism that the Lord has called us to do. That no matter what is happening, no matter who goes, who comes, what happens, what does not happen, you become unmovable, always abounding. Always abounding. It is very clear in the work of the Lord. And what is the work of the Lord? But to win souls into the kingdom. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, your labor will not be in vain. As we summarize, you remember we're talking about recovering the lost arch of personal evangelism. If we're actually going to recover the lost arch of personal evangelism, what's the implication? Number one, it means we recover our passion. Two, our desire. Three, our zeal. Four, our fire. And uh, five, our energy. Six, our enthusiasm. And seven, becomes our lifestyle. That means then you say, yes, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to recover the lost arch of personal evangelism, passion, passion within you. That's what to recover. And then desire, a kind of burning desire that puts a body within you. And then your zeal and the fire, that the fire is burning and you're never cold. And you never look warm about this and the energy, spiritual energy and enthusiasm and lifestyle. If that is going to happen and we're going to recover this lost art of personal evangelism, what does it take? Number one, realize. Realize. Uh, you, you are going to realize when you sit down and you say, 1976, this is the way I was. 1978, this was my passion, my zeal, my fire, my enthusiasm, my spiritual energy. And this was my program. This was the way I spent my time. 1985, this was the way I was spending my time evangelizing. And then you come to this day now, 2006. Ah, there's a lot of difference between 2006 and 1986 or 1989 or 1993. The time when I was really burning for the Lord. The first thing to do, if you're going to recover this passion, this fire, this zeal, this enthusiasm, this energy, this lifestyle, this zeal and desire, is realize, number two, repent of your negligence. And you realize, oh Lord, I see, there's a difference between the past and 
the presence. Because of that now, of that realization, I repent. Number three, renounce spiritual laziness. Renounce spiritual laziness. You understand? And let's say, for example, about 10 years ago, you were an athlete. You, you wake up in the morning and then you'll do some exercise, either the treadmill or you are jogging, you are, you are running, or you are doing some exercise to keep your body in shape. And now, after ten, about 10 years now, you stop all the exercise. You don't do that anymore. If you want to wake up now to get to do it, the bones are lazy. The joints are lazy, and the whole body, if you try about uh, 5 minutes, about 15 minutes exercise, you'll be having aches and pains all over your body. But you are intelligent enough to know you will endure that initial pain of coming back to recover your program of exercises. That means then you renounce spiritual laziness. Number four, you rededicate, rededicate your life. This is what must be done. I must do it. There's no alternative. I'm going to give myself to it. And then when you rededicate yourself, resume. Resume. It's not just that you are imagining and saying and thinking, I will do it. I plan to do it. I think I must do it. Actually respond. Respond to the needs around you. You resume that activity, that evangelism. It's like I've learned a lot today. I've heard a lot today. From what I've heard today, what I've learned today, I'm going to get something started. Resume. Number six, receive the promise of God. And receive the power of God. And receive the passion of the Lord in your soul. You receive from the Lord. And then now, number seven, you renew. You renew. You renew your own time, your own life. You reorganize yourself. You know, a lot of things have come into your life. You have been doing this and this and this and this. And all those things have crowded out the soul winning away from your life. Now, you reorganize yourself. You repeat what you used to do. You know, you, you get back. How was I spending my time? In 1985, how was I spending my time in 1989? How was I spending my time in 1990? How was I spending my time 10 years ago? And then now you reorganize your time and reorganize your life and say, yes, I understand. What has come into my life now? What are some of the things I can just get rid of that are not as important as personal evangelism? Not bad things. When you are Christians, we thank God you are children of God. We are not doing bad things, but are some good things I told you before that hinder better things or the best away from our lives. We get rid of those things that hinder personal evangelism. You organize yourself. You remember what it used to be. You make a repetition now of what you used to do and then you'll get back again. I said you'll get back again. And you will be useful in the hand of the Lord. And great will be the reward in your life in Jesus' name. And let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, yes, we're heard. And this is exactly what we're going to do. This is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to reorganize ourselves, organize our time, organize uh, everything around us so that what we have neglected this personal evangelism, it will be done. Just tell the Lord, tell the Lord you are sorry for the negligence of the past. It's a loving Savior. It's a merciful Savior. It's a compassionate Savior. He understands. He understands. And the moment you say, Lord, I'm sorry, that's the moment he says, I forgive you. But now, if you're truly sorry, you now say, Lord, I've realized, and Lord, I repent. Lord, I've realized, Lord, I repent. Lord, I've realized, Lord, I repent. And I renounce spiritual laziness. I will open my mouth. I will talk to my friends. I'll talk to my neighbors. I'll talk to people around me. I love them. I don't want them to perish. I love them. I want them to be saved. I will give my testimonies to them. How I came to know the Lord. I will stop thinking in my mind, evangelism is difficult. I'll stop that kind of unnecessary fear of any neighbor, any friend, any man, any woman. 
I now realize it's as simple as telling them, I am saved, you can be saved to you. I am married, you can be married to you. I am blessed, you can be blessed to you. I have Jesus as my Savior and Lord. You can have Jesus as your Savior and Lord to you. Simple as that. Renounce spiritual laziness. I say, Lord, here I am. I'm going to serve you. Mark out those people you need to tell. Identify those neighbors you need to tell. Rededicate your life. Rededicate your time. Rededicate your talent. Rededicate your voice unto the Lord. Lord, I will do it. A fresh commitment, a new commitment. I know you love the Lord. The Lord wants you to show how much you love Him by telling other people around you how they can be saved. Rededicate yourself. Whatever the good thing you are doing is not complete. Keep on doing those good things. Keep on doing those good things. But it's not complete until you tell other people how they can be saved. Whatever wonderful things you are doing are not complete until you are willing to tell other people and you actually program yourself to tell other people how they can be saved. And resume. Get started. You can do it. The greatest soul winners today started one day. You can start today. The most effective preachers, evangelists started one day. You can start your own today. Many people who have seen muscles in the kingdom of God won into the kingdom. There was one night they started. There was one day they started. You can start today. Resume. There are many needs around you. Respond to those needs. Many people who are ignorant of how they can be saved. You have the knowledge. You have the revelation. The Lord has opened your eyes to see. Help other people that their eyes to you will be opened. And they too will be able to see that Jesus is Savior. And Jesus can be their Savior. The Lord has forgiven you. Tell others how did you can be forgiven. Resume immediately. Resolve that I'm starting at this time. This knowledge, I'll meditate on it. I will apply it. I will stand on it. I'll work on it. Make it practical, workable in my life. Receive the promise of God. I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with your mouth. Receive the promise of the Lord. You don't have anything to fear. He will protect you. He will make you effective. He will make you productive. He will use you. You are a chosen vessel. And you will be his name. Before the people he has appointed you to take his name to. 
Don't allow the politics of the time, the activities of the time, the ambitions of the time, and the money-making projects of the time to take this evangelism away from your hand. Get involved. Get involved. Be part of this. Receive the power to do it. The presence of Christ is great power in your life. The possession of the Spirit of God is great power in your life. You can do it. You can do it. Don't talk negative about yourself. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can. You can. Or you can talk to your subordinates in your office. You can. You can talk to your colleagues in your neighborhood. You can. You can talk to your schoolmates. You can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can even talk to your boss, your director, your senior brother, your senior sister, your relatives, your parents. You can receive the promise, the passion, and the power. Renew your strength in the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The time you spend in the presence of the Lord is to renew your strength, to renew your conviction, and to renew your courage, and to renew this great work of soul winning the Lord has given unto you. Reorganize your time. Reorganize yourself. I'll do this at this time, this at this time, this at this time. And then you can leave some good portion of time for reaching out, distributing tracts, calling people to pray, helping them to understand how they can make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior. Reorganize yourself. Reorganize your time. Remember how you did it in the past. Repeat it. Do it again. And your rewards will be great. Your rewards will be great. Both on earth as well as in heaven. Commit yourself to it. The Lord will be with you.